Okay, Councillor Higgins, we're live. You can start the meeting when you're ready. Thank you very much, Lee. Um, good evening and welcome to the virtual meeting of the Major Applications Committee, the London Borough of Hillingdon. This is a virtual meeting also being broadcast simultaneously on the Council's YouTube channel. My name is Councillor Henry Higgins and I'm the chairman of this meeting. Before we start, some important online housekeeping. Please ensure your mobile phones are off or on silent. If wearing a headset, ensure your microphone is away from your mouth to avoid noise. Please keep the microphone muted when not speaking and then unmute to speak. Only one person may speak at a time. And as the chairman, I will choose those people to speak. Before we move on uh, to the agenda, I'd like to call a roll call of councillors present and uh, um, also members of the officer call. Uh, Steve, uh, Councillor Tuckwell. I'm present chairman, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Chapman. Good evening chairman, yes I'm present. Councillor Duncan. Yes, good evening chairman, good evening everyone, I'm present. Councillor Morgan. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I am present. Thank you. Councillor Morse. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chairman. I am present. Councillor Melvin. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I'm present. Councillor Hagger. Good evening, Chairman. Good evening, everyone. I'm and Councillor Sansipori. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. I am present. Thank you very much. Um, also, the officers present, uh, Planning Officer Mandip Mahorata. Present Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Zenib Ajam Islam. Zenib is not attending this evening. Okay, fine. Uh, Michael Bringshaw. Uh, present Chairman. Uh, Head of Planning, James Rogers. I'm Present Chairman. Uh, Alan, Transport Officer Alan Tilly. Good evening, Chairman. I'm present. Thanks. Our legal advisor, Glenn Egan. Good evening, Chairman. I'm present. Thank you. Uh, Democratic Service, Steve Clark. Evening, Chairman. Present. And Democratic Service Officer Liz Penny, is she present? Yes, present, Chairman. Oh, lovely. I didn't, I didn't see you. <laughs> Fine, great. OK. Um, in terms of any technical meeting control, if any council leaves the virtual meeting for part way through or a period of time like lost connection, I will continue the meeting unless we are not quorum, which is three councillors. Importantly, any councillor who does leave the meeting for a period of time will not be able to vote on that item where it is not present. Uh, we go through the agenda now. Apologies for absence. No apologies for absence tonight, Chairman. Uh, any declaration of interest from meetings? I cannot all see you on the screen, so if you have, you need to speak up. I'll take the silence. Uh, do we agree uh, the minutes of the last meeting? Agreed, Chairman. Thank you. Agreed. Agreed. Matters notified in advance or urgent, there are none. To confirm public or private reports, all part one public. Uh, we go to public report first is item six this agenda is uh, uh die martyrs school uh cardinal home campus 86 long lane Ickenham. this is a petition item so um mandate if you'd like to take us away thank you chairman item six is the dowry martyrs school at long lane in Ickenham. the location plan identifies the part of the application site which is subject to this planning application so this is the area identified in red with the access point on the road frontage this is the application constraints plan it identifies that the application site is located within a conservation area and adjoins a locally listed building the locally listed building is known as block a within the planning application report and is referred to on numerous occasions this is the application site location plan, so it is identifying that whilst the development outlined in red is part of the site, the wider site is also outlined in blue. Some of us may know that Dowie Martyrs is obviously um, located in 
on two separate campuses across the road from one another. So this site location plan identifies the remaining parts of the Dowry Martyrs campus on the opposite side of Long Lane. This is the proposed landscape layout plan. Now this application seeks planning permission to demolish um, blocks known as E, F, G and H and to create a single storey permanent building in this area of yellow identified on this plan. <clears throat> the application, however, does also, this is blocks E, F, G and H. Um, these are the existing buildings being demolished. We have existing elevations, so they're all single storey buildings at present. However, they are quite sporadic um, and not all connected together. So it's we're trying to, um, well, this application is seeking to demolish everything to provide a more fit for, for purpose um, school accommodation. These are the existing sections of the existing buildings. This is a proposed site plan which identifies in the red dotted line the buildings which are being demolished. So that's blocks E, F, G and H. And in the dark grey um, dashed lines is the permanent single storey building. There are some smaller temporary buildings being provided in order to accommodate the wider build programme. But there is also a two storey element going on to this grey area in the central location. Now, the temporary first floor building is simply to allow for decanting of block A, which is the locally listed building, to allow it to be refurbished. Now, these works to block A are subject to a separate planning application. It is not a major development. However, we are referencing it here because they are interrelated. This is the temporary ancillary building, which is located joining the permanent block and next to block A, but it's only a temporary facility. This is the proposed ground floor plan. So this is the building that will be in situ permanently. And during the proposed refurbishment works of block A, subject to a separate planning application, this is known as temporary block J at first floor level. So children will be decanted from block A and housed within the temporary block J for a period of uh, about 12 months um, as per the planning permission. So we do have, uh, obviously its removal will be required as early as possible in order to safeguard the amenity of residents. However, the, it has been identified that the works will take approximately 12 months and that's the period of time that the temporary build is required for. I take you through to the proposed ground floor plan for the permanent building. These are the roof plans for the permanent and the temporary facility. These are the block J permanent elevations, which are still single storey in form. So replicate those of the existing buildings being demolished. So blocks E, F, G and H. This is the proposed elevation with the permanent facility at ground level and then the temporary facility provided at first floor level. And further elevation drawings. These are the proposed elevations within the context of the locally listed building, which is identified, um, which I'm identifying on the screen at the moment. Further proposed elevations. Um, I thought it might be useful for you to be able to see that whilst there is limited, there is some scope for landscaping um, within this current application before us, the the, uh, the other application for the refurbishment of Block A is also pro proposing lots of planting and biodiversity enhancements along the Long Lane frontage. So whilst you might not be, might not consider that the landscaping is overly, um, is extensive under the current application, it is being provided in the area along the road frontage on the other application. These are the planting plans for this planning application, so they are limited to the site boundaries of the application site. I'll take you through to some photographs which do show the existing buildings which are in um, a significant state of disrepair and in need of refurbishment. This is the view from Gilby Close. So this is the, the part of the site, apologies, where the, vi the view of the temporary building will be most prominent. It should be noted, however, that the first floor structure is only temporary and it, although it will be visible and will cause some issues of amenity concern, they will be removed and they will only be for a temporary period. The application has been recommended for approval subject to the conditions within your report and the section 106 legal agreement as set out on page 11. I will hand back to the chairman. Uh, thank you, Mandip. Um, Liz, I believe we've got uh, some uh, petitions on this. 
Uh, no petitions on, on any items for majors tonight. Okay. Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we go straight to councillors. Um, above you is a little hand thing on this. Obviously, we. I think the public ought to forgive us this time because we've gone from Google now to Meet. So some of the councillors, you can either wave your hands and say that you want to speak or you can put your little hand up. And Steve Tuckwell has put, Councillor Cut Tuckwell, beg your pardon, has put his hand up first. So would you like to go first, please? No, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you for, for the presentation to officers. I, I really like this scheme. Um, I, I do. I think the existing buildings are no longer fit for purpose. That was clear from the photographs. Um, reading from the reports, it is uh, air quality neutral, which is good for a school. Um, but I do have a couple of questions. I know um, once the temporary building is removed, um, it's listed down for a green roof. I was just going to ask officers if that does need to be conditioned. The other question, couple of questions I've got is in relation to the temporary building, and I know we talked about 12 months, but I also know that residents, whilst there isn't a petition, have lodged some concern in the consultation about the building becoming permanent. I was just wondering if there was something we could put in a, a condition or at least an informative that says, you know, upon the works being completed, there was a certain amount of time that it needed to be removed. And the final point really was about um, the residents of Gilby Close, particularly the ones, I think it's number 19, and whether or not there is anything in place sort of to prevent overlooking into their amenity space um, from the temporary building, that is. Um, and that's it for me, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Tuckwell. Amanda, would you like to pick up on that? Yes, I can. So the green roof of the proposals are conditioned um, under condition number five of page 13. Um, the removal of the building we felt was more fundamental than just a condition so it's actually ahead of term in the legal agreement so there is the provision for the council to enforce uh, or injunct against the school should the building not be removed because it is um, there is no doubt that it does cause harm and it wouldn't be allowed on a permanent basis but it is required to facilitate refurbishment of the school building for the for the short period um, overlooking if you bear with me i will review the plans but i believe this was addressed in so far as the outlook does not overlook gilby close but bear with me and i would point you to the right page of the plan So page 215 does identify that there is an element of overlooking, but the overlooking is only into the flank elevation of number 19. So if you, I think the easiest way to describe that is that the ground floor plan on page 215 identifies that yes, there are windows that overlook number 19, but it would be the flank elevation of that house only. Yes, there would be some temporary loss of privacy potentially to the garden area from the upper floor overlooking from the back of that building. But again, it would only be for a temporary period, but it is acknowledged in the report that there is some element of harm. Thank you very much, Mandy. Has that answered your question, Councillor mm -hmm. Duncan? No, very uh, well articulated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, can I just ask, the temporary ancillary block, is that going to be removed too after the 12 months, as well as the first floor? Um, that's that's the first question I have. Um, the next one was, as this is on quite a busy main road, long lane, and there's a planting condition, um, can we specify that the planting what is possible will be as pollution absorbing as possible so that it cleans the air. Also, as we're going to have a first floor, which will um, look into people's gardens, um, there will be possible light pollution if those classroom lights are left on in the evenings. Um, so can we have automatic switch off and also could we have a grey water recycling condition which I haven't seen here. So just a few points there, please. Okay. 
Mandip, would you like to come back on that? Yes, that's absolutely fine. Uh, condition number five. Frustratingly, I have forgotten to add pollution absorbing trees to 1C, so I will do so under condition number five, 1C. Thank um, you. We will include pollution absorbing t trees. And yes, it's a very good idea to have the auto switch off, um, which again, I have forgotten to add. So thank you for the reminder. And we will add that as an additional condition. The grey water recycling, I will be honest, is normally part of the surface water condition. And if it is not, it, it will be added. Thank you, because that's easy to do, because you can recycle it into um, toilets, um, which, of course, you need in schools. Um, and could you just comment about the temporary building as well, please, Mandip? Apologies, yes. Head of term number five, so as set out on page 11, does state that it's the temporary first floor and the ancillary modular unit, which must be removed within 12 months. Oh. Great. Yeah, I did see the temporary first row. I didn't pick up on the module. Thank you very much. That's that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hager. Councillor Hager. Thank you, Chair. Actually, the questions have been answered. So and I'm quite happy with the responses. So I'm quite happy to support office recommendation for approval. I'm sure. Thank you. I have a proposal. That's fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Hager. Um, I have Councillor Morse next. And Mandip, sorry, do you, sorry, before I go to you, Councillor Morse, Mandip and uh, James both want to come in. Mandip first, ladies first. We probably want to say the same thing, and that's that I've forgotten to mention that there's an addendum on this item. Yes, I was going to pick it up in a minute before we enter the private, that's fine. I, I was just going to say, Chairman, on the drainage. So there was actually a drainage report uh, that the... Uh, flood and water management officer was satisfied with so i'd like to suggest an and or that either we have a bespoke condition that's saying they must comply with that report if it covers gray water okay or uh, that we have the normal suds condition that requires further details uh, okay. it, it, so, so it, yeah, yeah I, I hope that's okay chairman but no, i, I don't that, want them to do a, a whole new report if they've already done a report that actually addresses the matter that's perfectly fine. Uh, Councillor Morse, um, pardon? I wanted to ask a question about Condition 16. Um, yeah. It says that we the school should not exceed 1,680 pupils and the number of staff should not exceed 170. Uh, on my understanding, at present, this is a 7FE school, and um, if is this an increase? or is this as the school was because if there is an increase then should it not be advertised as well that's my question uh mandip i can confirm that there is no increase in pupil numbers however the planning permissions across the site have never conditioned or controlled the number of pupils at the school so we're using this as an opportunity because the development does have an increase in floor area but has been declared to have no additional students. So we did not assess the impact of additional pupil placements because it's been declared that there will be no increase in numbers, hence the reason that we felt it was necessary to impose condition 16. But there is no increase in pupil numbers at the school. Um, OK, uh, further, further yes, question. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Um, no, my next question is, if. You, you stated we increase the uh, area of teaching space available. Does this accommodate this this hot this well? To me, it is a higher level, 1680 uh, pupils, and does the 170 staff actually meet the requirements of 1680 pupils? Because there's teacher ratio. I don't, I, I don't see how that's a planning concern, but I will ask Mandy. Well, we're, we're, we're putting something in planning and it should be known. N not to control schools intake and staffing issues. I wouldn't have said so. Anyway, Mandy, please. I have to be honest, I don't know about pupil staffing ratios. However, the schools team have, have been the department who have, know, who have advised that this is the pupil and staffing cap that should be imposed. So James, do you have anything to add team. to that? It was just a very simple point that I, I happen to know the school uh, was 
that condition was one of a number of conditions shared with the school ahead of this meeting and, and they haven't uh, raised any concerns with the condition. So I just mention that because it might be relevant to any thoughts members have on, on, on that c c c condition. Okay, fair enough. I, is, um, has that answered your question, Councillor Moore? Uh, to some degree, it just I'm very aware that if you walk past the school about three o'clock in the afternoon, you'll see eight double desk buckers, buses <laughs> queuing up to, so, to take, to take right. staff, eight double deck, deck of buses queue up to take students back to Hayes. It's, it's, you know, there's an enormous amount of yeah, I, I, people I, that I, travel I, across the borough. I, I'm sure there is, but um, um, I don't think you're out there long enough to be counting each every student that goes through. So. But I'm I'm sure that if the school have, have advised that it's fine, I think we will have to go on their understanding. Um, and if it goes above that, it'll have to come back to committee. So there we go. Yes, uh, have you, Councillor Morgan? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I'd like to actually, as it's been proposed, I'll second the officer's recommendations. Um, including the addendum set uh, on the addendum sheet. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Has anybody else got anything? And uh, if Councillor uh, Moores, can you take your hand down for me that's on the screen? Um, I, I, before I go to the vote, I will ask Mandip to, we've had a few changes, let's make sure that we're all voting on the right thing. So Mandip, could you go through the changes that we've had and could you add additional conditions and formatives, please? Yes, amendment to condition five to include pollution absorbing trees. Point number two was to add an additional condition to, to have auto switch off of lighting. Thirdly, we will be adding either a grey water recycling bespoke condition or requiring implementation of the surface water strategy if it already includes grey water, grey water harvesting as part of the report. Okay. On that note, I'll go to the vote. Um, Councillor Chapman. Officer's recommendation, Chairman, with the amendments. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Yes, approve as amended, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Moore. Uh, Morgan second, Councillor Moores. Uh, four as amended, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Melvin. Yes, agreed as amended, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hagger proposed. Councillor Sansapuri. I can see you nodding. I'll take I'll take that. I, I can't hear you, but I can see you nodding this one. OK, uh, and Councillor Tuckwell. Four as amended, Chairman. Thank you very much. That's all. It's a full house. I, uh, Steve, do I go to you about that? Yes. Unanimously approved, Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, item seven. Mandip, would you like to take us out on this one, please? I'm going to hand over to Michael Wickenshaw. OK, welcome, Michael. Thank you. I don't, it's, it's, it's your first time with us. I hope yes. we, we don't scare you too much. Please, please proceed. Thank you. Right. Um, so item seven. Um, item seven relates to Keith House located on Keith Road in Hayes. Um, the site is um, split in two, east and west. And this application specifically relates to the west site as shaded in red. Um, it should be noted that there is likely to be an application submitted for the east site as well. Um, the site used to form part of an industrial business area, uh, but was removed as part of the adopted local plan. A conservation area is designated to the north alongside grade two listed and locally listed buildings. Uh, residential properties are located to the east on Keith Road and west on Guinness Close. Uh, a commercial estate is also located to the south. Uh, the site comprises a Yodel warehouse unit with one access point located on North Hyde Road, leading to a service yard. Uh, this slide shows the existing east and west elevations uh, and this slide shows the existing north and south elevations with the old vinyl factory building shown in the background. Um, the application seeks permission for the demolition of the existing warehouse uh, unit and redevelopment of the site to provide a mixed use development um, comprising 150 residential units and four flexible commercial units within the part seven, part nine storey buildings. A new Vicklet access is proposed more centrally off North Hyde Road. This leads to the central spine of the site, uh, which consists of ground level car parking to serve the ground floor commercial units and 570 square metres of public open space. 
The majority of car parking is provided under the first floor podium deck, uh, combining to provide a ratio of 0.43 car parking spaces per unit. Um, two resid re residential blocks are proposed, with block A to the north and block B to the south. The first floor podium deck can be seen between the two blocks and provides over a thousand square meters of communal amenity space with pockets of play space included. Uh, this slide shows the second floor, third floor, fourth and sixth floors, fifth floor, the seventh floor, which includes a roof terrace on block B, uh, the eighth floor, and the roof plan, which includes PV panels on both blocks A and B. Uh, this slide shows the ground floor of block A, which includes the four flexible commercial units. Uh, this shows the ground floor of block B. Um, these are the first and second floors of block B, which comprise 14 social rent units. Uh, the addendum notes that this plan has been revised to increase the number of three bedroom units within the social rent tenure from two to four. When measured by Hamilton Room, the overall development would uh, provide policy compliant affordable housing, uh, would not provide um, uh, policy compliant affordable housing. However, it is agreed that this is the maximum viable affordable housing provision possible within the tenure that best meets the needs of the borough. Uh, this proposal is supported by the council's housing team. And if recommended for approval, the Section 106 agreement would secure an early and late stage viability review. Um, this slide shows the uh, proposed east elevation of Block A, the north elevation, south elevation, and the west elevation. Uh, this shows the north elevation of Block B, the east and west elevations, and the south elevation. Uh, this shows the proposed north and south site elevations and the east and west site elevations. Um, when viewed in the context of neighbouring buildings, the bulk, size and mass of the proposal is considered to be appropriate. Um, the application also proposes to contribute towards off-site enhancement works, as listed on pages four and five of the committee report. Uh, this includes a contribution towards the enhancement of Keith Road, as shown here. Uh, new lighting, planting and surfacing would be secured and would serve to better connect Dorley Road to Keith Road and Keith Road to North High Road via the, public, uh, the proposed on-site public open space. Uh, here is a bird's eye view of the existing site. Uh, this shows the existing seven story office block located on Millington Road. And here are some photographs showing how the existing site appears at street level. Uh, here are some pictures of Keith Road as it exists. And this is the area for the offsite public realm enhancements uh, and also shows the old vinyl factory buildings in the background. Uh, this is the view uh, from the side looking down Keith Road towards North Hyde Road, uh, state, uh, the North Hyde Road and Station Road Junction. Um, so some comments have been received from neighbouring residents. Uh, the issues raised are considered to have been addressed within the committee report. Uh, concerns were raised regarding the number of parking spaces proposed and the impact on the local highway network. As stated within the committee report, the site is considered to, be, considered to be well connected and mitigation measures are secured by the Section 106 agreement, including highway improvements, a travel plan, parking permit restrictions, a car club scheme and a controlled parking zone review. The proposed level of uh, car parking is therefore considered to be on balance acceptable. The proposed development is recommended for approval subject to securing the recommended planning conditions and uh, Section 106 agreement. Uh, I pass back to you, Chairman. Chairman, I think you're on mute at the moment. See, that'll teach me for turning. I usually leave it on and get told off for leaving it on, but there you go. Anyway, I'm back. Well done, Michael. Thank you very much. That was really good. Um, it's uh, nice to see such uh, three bedrooms, I think, is uh, rentals is absolutely amazing. But anyway, I digress. First is Councillor Chapman, then Councillor Moores, and then Councillor Tuckwell and Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I can see why this is down for approval because it does tick a lot of good boxes. 157, well, sorry, 150 residential units is always welcome. And as you've pointed out yourself, lots of nice three bedrooms as well sort of thing. It's also very generous in terms of parking. I mean, I think it's 0.4 vehicles per unit. As we know, we've, we've passed stuff down at 0.1 recently or 0.15, I think it was. So uh, certainly we can't complain on that score. I do have misgivings regarding daylight and sunlight, although I accept that might not be 
clause by itself to turn it down, to reject it. However, I also would like more clarification regards amenity space, how much it is, how generous it is, that sort of thing. Also, um, as part of that, reference is made to a public open space. Do we mean public in terms of it is accessible to the general public or do we mean it's shared amongst the residents and it will only be accessible to residents? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Chairman. Who would like to take this, Mandip or Michael? Michael, you want to go? I'm happy to take Imagine. one of Councillor Chapman's questions, and that's that the public open space is fully accessible to the general public, not just those within the development. Um, and that's been secured primarily between this building and what will be the future building on site E. Now, the amenity space is set out within, bear with me, section 7.09 of your report. So that's page 129 onwards. So we have tried quite hard to make sure that we assess private amenity space, which is the balconies and any um, roof terraces that might exist, and then separately assess um, the communal spaces. So you can see on page 129, uh, there are details of the quantum of communal amenity space that is shared by all of the future residents, which is again separate to the public open space, which is detailed in more with more information on page 131. If you'd like to see where the public open space is, we can share a slide um, to show that. Yeah, might as well. Yes, please, thank you. Oh, I'm in the wrong slide, sorry. Here we are. So I'll use my pointer, but this is an area of public open space being delivered as part of this application. So you can see very faintly marked out parking bays. So this is where the parking spaces for the commercial development will end. And this will be publicly accessible open space. Now, Michael mentioned the enhancements being proposed along this public and sorry, this pedestrian and cycling path. So in effect, the public cycle path will lead into what will be publicly accessible open space. I will stop sharing and pass back to Councillor Higgins. Thank you very much, Mandy. Is that answered your questions, Councillor Chairman? It does very much so. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. OK, we'll, we'll move on. Uh, Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I'll start off with the first point is um, Pinkwell as a ward is defined as a ward insufficient in public space. So there's a deficiency through the whole ward. I will then go on to policy DMC 14. Uh, and under this policy, this development should provide 8,020 square metres of public space. The provision in this place is 7% of that required. So in my view, it clearly doesn't conform to policy DMC1. Um, I then wanted to touch upon the daylight. I'm glad uh, Councillor Chapman co covered this. Uh, it looks to me that there's, uh, and you look at some of the, um, uh, there's a 29% in, in a shortfall. Sorry, I've got the wrong paper. I apologise. I've got so many notes on this one. Um, if you look at page uh 31 of 200 short, fall short of the ADF requirements on the main block. That's 15%. That's a substantial number. If you look at the affordable block, 40 rooms fail to meet NSL values. That's 28%. Um, now, if you look at this light deficiency, this, as it says, is not on its own enough. But this is my second reason why I think this is adequate. This is not, this is not, one item on its own. I brought up this space deficiency, um, and I've also brought up why I'm concerned about uh, the, the other issues. Now, uh, if you then go on and uh, we look at play space, children's play space, um, it, it, it's the requirement under policy 
is 448.7 square metres of play space. There's 217 square metres of play space provided. This, this is a shortfall of 44%. Three, that's three issues. Um, I then want to go on to density. And if you look at this, um, it's uh, in the report, and I've got to get this, uh, it's referring to, uh, oh, God, there's so many bits of papers here. Um, I've lost my density notes here. Right. It provides it's 238 units per square hectare, where the, the policy requirement is 80 to 170. So it actually breaches density. Reason four, uh, uh, in my opinion. Um, I then go on to policy H5. And because this is not defined as land area, we are supposed to provide 50% in policy of affordable housing. We do not do that. So therefore, we also fail in H5. That's five policies. Okay. Now, I might be taking a more a, a severe view, but I take the view that we're, this could be of a better design. I'm not, I'm not objecting to the potential for using housing here, but I don't think this plan is good enough. And that is, that is my opinion, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Very Chairman. Much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Morse. I, I'll, before I go to offices, H5, um, I understand where you're coming from, but we are we 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 negotiate with the housing department, and, and rental is what they want. So we'll I, I can send the uh, mandate. Would you like to take some of those points, please? Thank you, Chairman. I think I have to. Um, if I lead from where you left off, policy H five states that you should either provide. 50% affordable housing unless you can demonstrate through a viability appraisal that you're delivering the maximum reasonable. So they have technically accorded with the policy requirements, which is that they have submitted a viability review and this is the maximum reasonable affordable housing that can be delivered on the site. The same process of policy compliance, therefore, is given to the amenity space. I note that you have looked at the calculations and there is a shortfall however because of the way in which on-site delivery will be so difficult at that quantum there is a mitigation measure which is financial contributions to improve other areas of public open space so in effect those two areas are actually policy compliant albeit by virtue of in lieu contributions or the viability review if we touch on density Yes, it is above the density standards. However, the London plan has recently removed re uh, reference to numeric density numbers. So it's it does actually accord with the requirements of the London plan, albeit our local density requirements are probably out of line with the new London plan policies. Um, and I think if you take all of those bits on balance, you'll you'll see why the officers have had to come to the conclusions that they have that the development is acceptable. Albeit, I appreciate all of those points that you have raised. There are daylight and sunlight failures, but they weren't deemed to warrant a reason for refusal. And yes, there, the site is deficient in child play space. Um, but again, it's the planning balance at, at the end, which was deemed to be acceptable overall. Thank, Thank you. And it, um, Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm I'm glad that the points have been raised, um, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna change the tone a little bit because I think those those points have been well made. It's around the highways access, so I just want to clarify: have we got a new access point now off of North High Road, and the other access point off Keith Road, that's going to be for cyclists and pedestrians. Is that correct? That's right. If I share the the screen again I can identify that this is the new vehicular access point into what will be hopefully the central spine and therefore a shared area between the two application sites sorry and there will be two car club bays located on this section of Keith Road but I believe that from this point onwards it will be pedestrian and cyclists only so that will be a new pedestrian and cycle route taking you from Keith Road up to Dorley Road. Okay. Thank uh, you. 
Alan. Yeah, thank you. I mean, again, I think uh, changing to the London plan has constrained officers somewhat, but I do share the, the concerns that have been voiced previously. So um, we'll see where the debate goes. Okay, thank you. Chair. Thank you. Uh, uh, Alan Tilly, did you need to add anything? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to add that the new access has been subject to a road safety audit and found to be satisfactory. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Uh, James Rogers, you coming in. Uh, can people put their hands down once they've spoken? Councillor Moores, Councillor Chapman, Councillor Duckworth. Yeah, I, I just wanted to give members a bit more comfort on the whole issue of daylight and sunlight. So if you have a site where there's buildings of six storeys or above and there's more than one block, you will inevitably have units on the lower floors that there'll be some windows that will not fully pass the daylight and sunlight. Uh, and we see this on, on all, all of the kind of uh, buildings that, all of the schemes where you've got buildings that are six stories or above and more than, more than one building. So the question to me is, is there something on this site out of the ordinary that's going beyond what we might expect? And the answer to that question is no. In effect, yes, there are some daylight and sunlight fails, but nothing more than would be expected, basically. Uh, uh, and I know that's not ideal, but the alternative would be to remove entire blocks uh, and then you'd uh, re you'd effectively be so far away from op optimising the level of development on site. You'd be doing something that I don't think would be the right approach. Uh, so I hope that gives members a little comfort on the daylight and sunlight issue. Thank you, James. Uh, Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, one or two points. Uh, I don't think we say in landscaping that it should be pollution absorbing, if we could put that in. And also in condition 29, it talks about full details of the mechanical ventilation heat recovery system. Um, and I think this is addressing the issues that were raised in the London Plan 5.9. Um, it's a different number now in the London Plan that's been approved, I believe. But this is because of overheating because of the systems that have been put in in some more recent uh, residential developments. And I wondered if this was, because it just talks about mechanical ventilation heat recovery. Well, it's not just about heat recovery, it's about the distribution, because in some of these blocks you've had hot water pipes running down corridors communal corridors that are accessed by everyone to get to their um, flats and it's made it unbearably hot particularly which is wonderful in the winter but it's um, unbearable in uh, a hot summer days and weeks so I was just uh, querying that asking for a little more explanation in our plan pack uh, I couldn't see what the parking arrangements were. It is less than we would normally expect. And I hope that there's going to be sufficient blue badge parking because when parking is restricted, very often um, there's not in, can be insufficient blue badge parking. Um, I was also going to ask, in view of the fact that this is a multi-storey building, presumably, and I know we put on a condition about materials, and that's about what it looks like, but I would like to know that uh, these claddings that go on in whatever form are safe, and I hope that, uh, you know, we don't really need to ask that. Presumably now everything is vetted much more carefully after Grenfell. And I was rather sad to hear that the density limits in the London plan have been removed and that really we have no redress uh, against this at all. This was one of the matters we spoke against at the... Um, uh, the public inquiry, the examination in public of the local plan, and I know that subsequently they've been increased since. And this seems to be at the expense of the whole living environment with 
reduced amenity space, reduced play space, and we seem to be going backwards, not forwards. And just to say that it is all driven by money, well, of course, money is important, but also what we're doing and what we're providing for people to live in now and for the future is something that we should be fighting for better standards, not just accepting less. And I think that we should be making these points um, uh, that we can't accept uh, poorer housing quality uh, for people and less affordable housing quality just because somebody has bought something at a particular price and they've got to uh, cut corners to do this. This is the wrong approach, not something that I am in favour of. However, if uh, um, it's decided that we approve this, I would ask that those um, condition issues that I've raised, please, if uh, I could just be assured that they are OK. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Duncan. Uh, Councillor, oh, sorry, Mr Rogers, you'd like to come in. I see you waving. Yeah, I was just going to say we can add pol pollution ab absorbing that again should be there my apologies uh uh the um we do seem to be missing a fire safety condition unless Mandy is able in a minute to refer it it's in the, the addendum sorry we oh it's in the addendum it. sorry yeah yeah okay, okay. Yeah. Back, back the end. Uh, can i take uh, overheating uh, and i'll yes. let Mandy take overheating <laughs> so i think um, we've so councillor duncan we've already had or committee members, we've already had a declaration from the applicants that there is going to be a mechanical heat uh, recovery system within the building, hence the reason that the condition is framed as such. However, taking on board Councillor Duncan's point, the second part of the condition, which starts with the submission shall demonstrate how the development mitigates overheating risk, that relates to all of the development. So it probably could have been rephrased to be a two-part condition. So we want details of the mechanical heat recovery as point one but the second part is in effect that the entire development must demonstrate that they have mitigated overheating risk we yeah. if you're happy for us to do so we can clarify yes, yes that'd be fantastic that will be really good mend it yeah we divide that up into two and that makes it a lot secure and obviously the um mustn't forget janet's plants the, the absorbing ones that we always she always mentions and um I'm sure it's there, Mandit, but if it isn't, please make sure it is. OK, we will now move on to Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I mean, I'm just looking at the, the parking allocations and um, you know, I'm reading on page 60, 66, the parking management and allocation, but there's nothing mentioned about electrical charging points. Um, I was going to mention about motorcycles, but that may uh, upset you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So if officers could mention about the how many electrical charging points there'll be and things like that, please. Yes, Mandy. So on page 63, condition number seven details all of the electric vehicle charging points, and there are five motorcycle spaces. Uh, there you go. Yeah, happy twice. There we are. There. I, I love motorbikes. Please don't sort of mend blood. I do. I just, you know, electrics are much better. Anyway, I will move on to the next person that wants to speak is Councillor Hagger. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I was just going through and I was a little bit concerned about the flooding and the surface water and the sewerage. Now, I'm reading the report. It's quite robust. There's a lot in there that Thames Water have requested. I know we have condition 19. Obviously, with the final method, we've got condition 23. Are we quite happy with those conditions set under what Thames Water have advised? Because, again, it, it's the same thing, isn't it? We've got a, a big block going up here. We haven't got good pipe work that's already instated on, on previous older properties. And I just want to make sure that we're fully covered, especially on the surface water and on the sewerage. As we're reading page 88, there is a lot in there that Thames Water have um, obviously picked up. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, do you want to pick that up quickly? And then. I do believe it's covered by the conditions. In effect, the lead local flood 
authority officer, which is our internal officer, is the person who sets the conditions um, within, within the conditions of the report. Okay, thank you. Can I have someone to propose this, please? I haven't had a proposal yet. I'll propose it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Morgan. Can I have a seconder, um, please? I'm happy to second it, uh, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Melvin. Okay, now before we go to the vote, Mandip, there has been some changes with the there condition have. stuff. So can you just run through that before I? The, there are two changes. Condition number one must include pollution absorbing trees, and change number two is condition 29 is to be divided into two parts and clarified and also the things on the amendment as well yeah and yes everything in the addendum as well thank you yeah thank you great fine so councillor chapman chairman before we go to the vote yes uh, i did ask a question about blue badge parking and I'll i don't upon, think that was covered upon. Uh, you upon, if you wouldn't mind. No, yeah. no problem. Sorry, that's my mishap. Sorry, uh, Mandip. Apologies. Yes, there are nine um, accessible bays within this development, which is set out under condition number seven. Now, nine accessible spaces is uh, is to facilitate the entire development. Now, bearing in mind that the entire development is only delivering 0.4 car parking spaces per unit, there are more accessible bays than the 0.4 ratio. So I, I think we're satisfied that we're getting more than we, we would um, okay. on, on other developments. OK. Is that OK, Councillor Duncan? Yes, it, it didn't actually um, list them, did it, in this? I did look through um, that, that. Well, it's condition seven, isn't it, in different parts? 2D. Oh, 2D. Car parking layout. Residential flats. So it's called accessible parking spaces. Yes. Mm -hmm. The blue badge. Lovely. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank Things you for that clarification. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Right. Now, with all that and what we said before, we're going to go to the vote. Councillor Chapman. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I will unenthusiastically go with officer's recommendation. Uh, I have to say Councillor Morse and Duncan have, have articulated my misgivings a lot better than I could, but I will still go along with officer's recommendations plus the various amendments. Thank you very much. Councillor Duncan. I'm abstaining, Chair. Thank you. Um, we had Councillor Morgan proposed. Councillor Morse. I can't hear you. Your microphone's off. There you go. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I am voting against for the five policy reasons and I will want them recorded in the minutes as to why I voted against this. I don't accept this is high quality housing. Fine, right. uh, we'll do that. Uh, Councillor Melvin uh, seconded. Uh, Councillor Hagar. Yes, four, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Sanspuri. Four, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Tuckworth. Four, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Steve, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, four, one against and one abstention. Is that correct? Correct, Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, we go move on to item eight. Mandip. Thank you, Chairman. I will just share my screen. I'm sorry. Everybody turn their, um, their hands down, please. Thank you. And turn your microphones off. Amanda, over here to you. Thank you, Chairman. I think it's actually my um, microphone, which isn't helping, so sorry. So if I take you through to item number eight, which is 23 Stonefield Way in Ricelip. The application proposes is, well, I'll take you through the plans. The site is located on the corner of Stonefield Way, outlined in red here. The entirety of the site is within a designated business area. The site is occupied by Travis Perkins, who have been in operation for a number of years now. So this is the main builder's merchant building itself. And then there is an extensive yard which has a frontage on two streets. This is the site layout, which again shows the actual unit itself and the vehicular access into the site on Stonefield Way through the development site. And there's an exit point um, on, the other, on the other road frontage. The proposal is to seek to vary a limit that the council imposed on the external stacking height 
of materials at the site. Back in 2015, we granted planning permission for the redevelopment of the site to provide a builder's merchant's yard um, and yard, sorry, and we set a limit on the stacking height of external materials within the yard area. We did this for uh, primarily for visual amenity reasons. The higher the building, the higher the stacking of materials, the more imposing it is on the public street scene. We appreciate that this is an industrial business area. We wanted to support the use of the, of the yard by the timber merchants. However, we did impose the limit to try and mitigate any potential harm. A few years ago, or I think maybe last year, we had an application submitted to increase the height of the external storage to, I believe it was five meters. Um, at the time, we felt this was excessive and the application was refused. Um, and at an appeal, an inspector agreed with us that the, the height of the external storage should not be um, so high along the street frontage on both highways grounds. So that's the potential harm to future uh, to pedestrians on the public highway and also because of visual amenity reasons. And for that reason, we have this current application which seeks to amend the storage heights to three metres along the road frontage here. If for context, this boundary fence height is 2.4 metres, so it would not be more than probably the height of those pallets on the corner. The internal storage yard would be allowed to increase its height for storage to four metres, so it would be less imposing when viewed from the street. There's also a special mechanism to prevent the materials from falling and have, causing potential harm to pedestrian safety. That has now been um, deemed to be acceptable. So this application is recommended for approval um, alongside the recommendation, uh, the conditions as set out from page 154 of your committee reports. I will hand back to Councillor, the Chairman. Thank you, Mandip. All right, Councillor Tuckwell, you put your hand up first, so off you go. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, know this uh, know this part of the world exceptionally well. Um, it's a well used um, industrial part of South Ryslip. Um, I have no objections to uh, what's being proposed here, and I'm happy to go with officer's recommendation. Thank you. So I have a proposer. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Morgan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I'm look, just looking at page 90 of the presentation. Um, if Mandip can go to that, please. There's um, uh, uh, an area that's been stacked up that looks well higher than the four metres uh, that um, is being currently proposed here. Um, you know, if we are going to uh, go with this, and I'm quite happy to second it, we do need to make sure that we do enforce it accordingly. Uh, because, you know, I'm just, as I said, I'm looking at page 90 of the presentation and there's a photograph there where it looks like they've got stuff stacked well above the, the four metres in height. But uh, I'm quite happy to second uh, the, the proposal. OK, man, I suppose the, the, the main thing is there is how are we going to police it? I mean, what do we do? Go, someone goes by occasionally or? In effect, the conditions are there to protect the street scene and visual amenities. So we we would expect not just officers um, and committee members, but also members of the public, if they felt it was too high, they they should be reporting um, the breach to us. OK. OK. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I do feel concerned about it being um, at three metres on the frontage and the inspector did say in the uh, proposal that was refused it has been dem it has not been demonstrated that the safety of pedestrians and road users on Stonefield Way would be maintained so we have to think about that and if the fence is 2.4 I would be happy for it to be 2.4 next to the fence and then maybe one metre in it could go up to three metres but um, when we have you know stormy weather high winds um, some of which you know parts of the country have been experiencing recently and earlier with climate change um, I do think that it does pose a risk so when Mandip said that there are measures 
to um, make this safe for pedestrians. I would like to hear those, please, before we do come to vote on it. I'm happy with everything else about it. It's just pedestrian safety I'm concerned about. I, I do think you're going to break into song there, Janet, with stormy weather, but there we go. Mandip, would you like to just tell us how they're going to save, save it from falling? Thank you, Chairman. So they have proposed to install anti-collapse anti mesh to the various stackers around the site, which would assist in preventing the spillage of goods onto the public highway. Now, the highways team have reviewed the application and do consider that this mechanism should provide the, the level of safety that's required that the inspector, the inspector felt was insufficient when he was considering his, he or she, or considering the, the appeal scheme. Thank you. Uh, so, Alan, Alan so, just, Janet, just one second, Janet. Alan Tilly, do you want to come in on that, please? Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mandip's covered the points that I would have raised, and um, I have nothing to add. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Janet. Yes, can we see that in a condition somewhere? Where is that, please? because obviously that's important and important for um, members of the public. If members of the, if we're relying on members of the public to police this, you know, in terms of its height, um, it's also about this safety mesh or netting that they should have there so that people could see that. Where have we got that, please? We don't. Could we put that in then? Mind it. Yes, that's absolutely fine to have an additional condition. Now, we have, I believe, been provided with the details of the anti-collapse mesh. So this would be a, a compliance condition to ensure that the mesh was in situ at all times. Yes, that okay? that'd be fine. That okay. would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, Mandy, you know, we better review what we've just changed and then uh, we'll go to the vote. So, Chairman, we are only adding one new condition requiring the implementation um, and retention of anti-collapse mesh. Thank you. I will go to the vote now. Councillor Chapman. Officer's recommendation, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Duncan. Yes, approval. Thank you. Councillor Morgan, second. Councillor Morse. Uh, four as amended, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Melvin. Yes, four as amended, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Hagger. Yes, four chair as amended. Thank you. Councillor Santipuri. Four, Mr. Chairman, as amended. And Councillor Tucker's proposed. Uh, Steve, I'll make that a full house. Is that correct? Unanimously approved, Chairman. Thank you very much. Item nine, Mandit. Thank you, Chairman. Agenda item nine is 19 to 22 Chippendale Way in Uxbridge. The application was before us, I believe, a year or two ago for the redevelopment of the application site to provide 12 residential units. So the application site is located opposite the into car park entrance. So I, I assume everyone is fairly familiar with the application site or the location in general. I would hope so. We approved permission for 12 residential units and this is an application to vary the approved plans to make minor changes to the development the minor changes are listed within the description of development. Those are those six changes at the top. In effect, we're seeking to ensure that we can deliver um, M43 residential units. And also there are some simplifications proposed by the applicants. I'll take you through the site constraints plan. So the application site is located here in red, not within the primary shopping area, which is in blue, but close, well, opposite the application site. This is the site location plan. So this identifies all of the residential units located along Chippendale Way with the communal amenity space located along the back and car parking spaces accessed by this internal road here. These are the proposed floor plans. So it's the M43 units which are being accommodated by a very small um, proportionate increase in floor area across the building. These are the elevations which are not changing significantly. However, there are alterations proposed to the balconies. These are the elevations, the streets, the street and site sections. So again, there is no increase in height to this building or in effect its form. So there are only 
they're such marginal changes that you probably wouldn't notice them um, based on the plans. This is the bird's eye view of the application site. This is the application site as I believe it is at the moment, it's hoarded off and next door to the nursery located on the corner of the application site. So this is from within the application site with the into shopping centre across the road. The application is recommended for approval and is subject to all of the conditions that were previously imposed and all of the heads of terms that we previously imposed, which are set out from, from page 172 of your committee report onwards. There is no change to the affordable housing and no change in circumstances overall to warrant a refusal of the application. I will hand back to Councillor, the Chairman. That's all right. Thank you very much, Mandip. Um, obviously, it's uh, straightforward. Um, Councillor Duncan. Yes, um, I think it's good that we're now providing M43 requirement meeting that. I propose the officer's recommendations. I thought you might. That's, that's very good. It is very good. I totally agree with you. Um, Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I completely agree. This is a welcome improvement and I'm happy to second. Thank you very much. So there's been no changes to condition, so we'll go straight to the vote. Um, Councillor Chapman. Go with officer's recommendation, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Duncan proposed. Councillor Morgan. For Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Moore. Uh, for Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Melvin. Uh, for Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much. Councillor Hager. For Chairman. And Councillor Sansafuri. Four, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, and Councillor Tackle seconded. So I make that a full house, Steve. Yes. Yep, unanimously for the officer's recommendations. That's it. You you say the correct term, I'll just say full house. We'll go to the next one, which is item ten, which is which is us just telling other other councillors what to do. So we'll uh, I'll let you go. Mandy. Item 10 is a out of borough consultation with Kinghamshire County Council. The application is proposing a motorway service station in um, relatively close to our borough boundary. It's a fairly sizable application site, primarily because the motorway service station would be on both sides of the M25. You'll note that um, within the report there are a number of areas where we just feel that uh, the application is, is is unable to be supported not just because of the quantum of development that's proposed there are so many town centre uses that have the potential to cause significant harm to Uxbridge town centre which is the closest town centre to the application site within our borough we also have concerns about highways and vehicular movements uh, the it one of the main routes into the application site um, is also proposed for uh, staff access into the motorway service area. Now, we, we don't feel that it's necessary that staff have a separate access into the development site than all other users, and therefore we are objecting to the additional traffic which has the potential to impact the vehicular movements into the London Borough of Hillingdon. We are objecting to the proposal as set out on page 194 and seeking further information. You'll note this is one of three motorway service station applications in and around various boroughs. So there is one in Chalfont St Giles and also a third in Watford, I believe. So all of these are undetermined. And the reason adding to the, the concern is that there's the potential that all three might be developed um, and we don't really need three and I believe they're all on Greenbelt land as well. So there are lots of uh, concerns with this current motorway service station application, and I hope you'll support the objection that we're hoping to submit. Thank you, I'm Chairman. Thank you very much, Major. I'm sure we will. Councillor Chapman first. Thank you, Chairman. I'm more than happy to propose that we go with officer's recommendation. I, I must admit, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, this will be the one between 16 and 17. <laughs> and then I realised this is a different one at 15 and there's one up at 20 as well sort of thing. So it was quite a revelation. I, uh, I, and equally, when you read the scope and scale of all three sites, um, they're way over what's needed as a service station and it's all in Greenbelt. So go with officer's recommendation, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you very much. You can only get one subway or Kentucky Fried Chicken in. Uh, Councillor Duncan. 
Yes, I second uh, the recommendation. Thank you very much. I have counts. Oh, no, they've all gone away because I think they're all going to say second it. So we just go straight to the vote. There's been no changes. Councillor Chapman proposed. Councillor Duncan second. Councillor Morgan. Four, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Morse. Four, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Melvin. Yes, four, Chairman. Thank you very much, Councillor Hagar. Four, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Sansapuri. Four, Mr Chairman. And Councillor Tuckwell. Four, Mr Chairman. Thank you. I would like to say thank you for all those watching and um, I close the meeting. Um, those of you that uh, are on the next one, I will see you shortly. But uh, have a good evening. And Steve, can you tell us when the feed is?